Welcome to the weekly sermon at Church of the Resurrection. We're glad that you're here. Resurrection is a place where kids, students, and adults find a safe, authentic, and welcoming community where everyone belongs. If you don't have a church family, we'd like to invite you to join us for worship online at core.org slash live or in person at any of our locations in the Kansas City area. You can learn more about us at core.org. We pray that God will use this message to help you grow in your faith journey and inspire you to make a difference in the world around you. My name is Ashley, and I serve as a planned giving specialist for the Resurrection Foundation. As we continue in worship today, I invite you to hear these words from Scripture. Our first passage comes to us from Joshua 4. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose twelve men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priests are standing, and carry them over with you, and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the twelve men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up the stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites, to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel. It's my privilege to introduce our guest preacher for the day, someone who actually needs no introduction at Church of the Resurrection. I first met Debbie Nixon in 1991. She and her family began attending Church of the Resurrection at the McGilly Chapel Funeral Home. Very quickly, she volunteered to work in our children's ministries and did such a great job that I had a conversation with her one day and asked her if she would leave the full-time job that she was doing and begin working part-time for Church of the Resurrection. We paid her below minimum wage. That's all we had to pay. And she said, yes that she wanted to be a part of changing the world. And during that period of time, over the next few years, she became our full-time children's ministry director, part-time to full-time. And the impact she had literally on thousands of children in Church of the Resurrection, we're all, all adults now, but she was the one who had that impact through our volunteers and with the vision for what children's ministry could be. From there, she moved into adult discipleship. So we moved her from children to adults, adult discipleship and missions. And the impact that she had in developing our adult ministries and launching our people into mission across the country and around the world profoundly impacted, again, countless numbers of people. From there, she was already giving leadership to our uh, work in the Leadership Institute. And so we asked her, would you be willing to help our Leadership Institute thrive and to help us connect and share all of our best ideas with churches across the country and again, around the world. There are thousands of churches in the United States who know of Debbie Nixon, 14,000 churches who've used more and more, churches who have used one or more of our resources and Debbie Nixon led and developed that effort for many, many years. She led five capital campaigns or more, probably more, but she led many of our capital campaigns here at Resurrection, making it possible for us to do the things that we've done at all of our locations. Debbie Nixon from there uh, began to work with all of our locations in launching locations. So, so our first four locations, Debbie was responsible for helping launch each of those locations. So if you're at one of our locations today, Debbie played a pivotal role in you being there and your location starting. Then we asked her if she would help us in helping our people think about the foundation, the Resurrection Foundation and leaving a legacy. And that's what she's gonna be preaching about today. So now today she oversees all of our capital campaigns, all of our generosity efforts and our foundation efforts helping people to leave a legacy. This year, this month, she celebrates her 30th anniversary on our staff, 30 years. I will tell you this, there is no one on our staff who's worked harder, given more of themselves. I tell you, there's not a week goes by, she's not working 60 hours a week or more, and, and who has poured herself into seeing this church build a Christian community where non-religious and nominally religious people are becoming deeply committed Christians. Church of the Resurrection would not be what it is today, would not be who it is today, and would have never had the impact it has had were it not for Debbie Nixon. So I'm gonna invite you to join me in expressing your appreciation, whether you're one of the locations or here at Leave It or on TV or online, expressing your appreciation for Debbie Nixon as she comes to preach. My goodness, how humbling. It has been an honor to serve here at Resurrection for the past 30 years. But most importantly today, it gives me the opportunity to tell you thank you. To say thank you to this church and to its people for the difference that you have made 
in my life, my husband's life, in our children's life, and our extended family since 1991. You have changed our lives, and we say thank you. And as a part of my role today in the Resurrection Foundation, I get the joy of bringing you a message about creating your legacy story. Let me give you a roadmap of where we're going to go. It's going to include stones. It's going to include birthday celebrations, butterscotch pie, fingerprints, and then an invitation. An invitation for you to begin to write and to live into your own unique story of legacy. The one that God has created and crafted just you to live into, to leave an imprint on the world and the communities in which you live. But first, let's acknowledge that it's Memorial Weekend. And for many of us, Memorial Weekend is that weekend that really signals the unofficial start of summer. And so our weekend is likely filled with family gatherings, picnics, outings at the lake, parades, and some of you likely going to cemeteries to visit those that have gone before us. Memorial Weekend is a federal holiday, has been designed to give us time to pause, to reflect, and to remember. The origins of Memorial Day and weekend started back in the 1860s when women from Pennsylvania and Mississippi went to lay flowers on the headstones of their family members that had been lost, their lives had been lost in war. As they went to lay those beautiful flowers there, they made a radical decision to demonstrate an act of radical kindness and compassion by decorating the headstones of every soldier that was laid to rest there, no matter whether they were Union soldiers or Confederate soldiers. They had no idea of the difference and the legacy they would leave by this act of kindness. And so today, this imprint, first known as Decoration Day, has become to be known for us as Memorial Weekend and Memorial Day. So we pause and we reflect and we give thanks to all those who so bravely have given the ultimate sacrifice of their lives so that we may enjoy our freedoms. And we give thanks and we pause and remember all of those who have gone before us. You know, a memorial helps us keep the memory of something really significant that has happened. Even God knew that his people would need to have memorials because we tend to forget things. And so in the Greek and scripture, we have the um, word for memorials. It is naomai. Naomai, to help one recall, to help one remember, to help one be mindful of. From our scripture reading from Joshua that we heard today, we learned about a memorial of stones, stones that had been erected and piled together as a marker to serve as a memorial so that generations to come would never forget God's faithfulness. And they would be able to share that story to generations forever. We hear these words again from Joshua. In the future, your children will ask their parents, what about these stones? Then you will let your children know Israel crossed over the Jordan here on dry ground. This was because the Lord your God dried up the water of the Jordan before you until you crossed over. This was exactly what the Lord your God did to the Red Sea. He dried it up before us until we crossed over. And this has happened so that the earth's people might know that the Lord's power is great and that you may always revere the Lord your God. A legacy of stones to forever tell God's story of faithfulness generations to come. You know, stories are important. My family recently had the incredible blessing of being able to celebrate my mom's 80th birthday. 
When we asked my mom what she wanted for her birthday, her only request was that she would have time with my sisters and I to share stories and to look through things that were important to her. And so she brought a tub of family photos. She brought our family trees and she brought special memorabilia that was important to her life story. Each day we spent hours at my kitchen table looking through these treasures. We heard stories about them. We asked questions about them and we learned about those who came before us. Every day we themed it around a particular era of her life. And we listened as she shared stories that had been passed along to her from her grandparents and great grandparents. We got to hear stories about what it was like for her in her childhood years, her motherhood years, and her now treasured years as a grandmother and a great grandmother. And our meals were also themed around these particular eras. As we cooked the meals, I began knowing that these meals were extremely special because these were the smells of home, my home, my childhood. It brought back memories of the sights, the sounds of my great grandparents, my grandparents, my extended aunts and uncles and cousins, and of course my parents and my siblings. And one of our meals did include our famous to us butterscotch pie carefully made through the handwritten instructions left by my grandmother. For me, this was such a meaningful time. We had the opportunity to reflect on family members no longer with us. We reflected on their stories. We listened to my mom's stories. And then we began to reflect on the impact that those stories had on us. It was powerful. It was moving. And it made me wonder, what are the stories that my grandchildren will someday share about me? Last week, I got to pick up my seven-year-old grandson from school. And as we were in the car together and he's in the back seat, he's telling me all about his day at school. And in the midst of that, he paused and he said, Grams, I hope you live to be a hundred. You know what? I I hope I live to be a hundred too, to get to experience these kind of treasured times with him and my other grandchildren. But the reality, as we all know, is that we don't know how much time we have. I don't know how much longer I'll be here. None of us do. And so what I realized is that there is a sense of urgency right now to begin thinking about the legacy that I am leaving. What is the story that's gonna be told about me? Not only from my own grandchildren, but my children, my friends, my coworkers, the communities where I've lived, and even you, my church family. You know, legacy is a really fascinating um, because it not only speaks to the future, but it speaks to the present. Our legacy, The stories that will be shared about us are being written by the way that we live. And so the question is, what is the legacy I am leaving and how will I be intentional about leaving it? I wanna invite you to write those questions down and reflect on those in the coming week. The scripture describes it this way. A good life gets passed on to the grandchildren. Or let me say it this way. A good life gets passed on to the next generation. You know, a legacy is the one that we've lived. And it's an intentional mindset about our resources and how the resources that have been given to us, the ones that we've worked so hard to earn and achieve, it's how we're gonna use those resources, how we will share those resources. And so how do we get started? First, I wanna encourage you to write a legacy letter. Now I know you may have heard that idea before. I'd heard it before. I thought, I don't know, it sounds a little silly to me, 
But in preparation for this sermon, I actually took the time to do it. It's a legacy letter that is helping me begin to think about and shape the way I want to live. It's not something you have to share with anybody else. And so the ways that I began thinking about the letter is I began thinking about what would I want written in my obituary? What would I want to be remembered for? And then again, what are those stories that others will share about me? It makes us pause and think about what is that good life that the scriptures talk about that we will be passing along to others. And so I thought about that. And while I would be okay being known as someone who loves the lake and horses and cooking, as someone who works really hard and who is totally obsessed with coffee, I think in reality, I want my story to be known as something much, much more. I hope that some might say that I strive to make a difference for others that I dedicated my life to being available, that I offered radical hospitality, that I loved fully, was generous, and that I sought daily to be a follower of Jesus. Now, can I just tell you saying that sounds way too aspirational, but by writing those things down, it is helping now for me to have a plan to think about how might I even just live into some of those and actually create focus in living into my legacy story. So I wanna encourage you to do the same. Once we have our legacy story, then we need to think about those resources, how we can better direct those with greater intentionality to live into it. And so what are some of those resources? The first is your stories. Share your stories, your life stories. Share your memories with others. Share your experiences with others. Hearing my mother share her stories, I began seeing the rich legacy that has influenced me from the generations before. I have a friend whose children has given him actually an online subscription that's helping him each week to craft and write his life story. And the end product will be a beautiful hardbound book. So I did for Father's Day, grand, maybe give it to a father or a grandfather. Now, not all of us want to write a book. And so what are some other ways that we can share our stories? Again, and I don't wanna encourage you to do it and not wait until you're 80 like my mom did. <laughs> Here's an idea. Families with younger children that are part of this church, we have our fall family retreat coming up. What an incredible opportunity and time to be uninterrupted with your children, to enjoy sharing stories with one another, making memories together and having fun. And so I wanna encourage you to sign up for that and you can get information on how to sign up at Next. And likely the most important story that you have to share is your faith story. What would you want others to know about the goodness of God in your life? The difference that Christ has made. Scripture says it best. We will tell to the coming generations the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders he has done. So share your stories. Another resource you have is your time. Volunteer. There are so many opportunities where you can use your time and your skills to make a difference in your community, your neighborhood, your church. Your time by volunteering makes this world a better place. There are again, many ways to volunteer. Here's an immediate opportunity for you. You can sign up if you live in the Kansas City area to be a part of our annual Bless the School Makeover. Yearly, we gather from all of our locations to bless one of the schools in the Kansas City area. Your presence and the work that you do, whether it's painting or organizing or cleaning or passing out ice cream sandwiches, all leave a lasting imprint on the children and the staff for generations to come. Being a part of the Bless the School 
um, has given Reed and I the opportunity to actually serve together. And there have been times in the past years where our children have come and joined us. And I look forward to the days when our grandchildren are old enough that we'll bring them too. And so not only think about volunteering for yourself, but find ways that maybe you with your extended family can volunteer together as well. It's shared experiences that are beginning to shape your legacy story now. Other way to live into your legacy and use your time is to, again, share those skills and knowledge that you have. If you know how to do woodworking, build a birdhouse with one of your grandchildren. If you know how to bake, teach someone how to bake. If you know how to goth, teach someone how to goth even. If you know how to do cannonballs off the side of the dock or a poolside, you should do that too. Now, random, I know, but I put it in there because that is exactly what is happening in my family. Our grandchildren are learning the very best technique from their Papa Reed. It's an annual tradition that they will remember forever. This week, our church lost two amazing saints, two women who each left their legacy for many. Sharon was one of the very first to ever teach Sunday school here at Resurrection. She dedicated her life for decades here teaching children. And because of her, our children's ministry has been shaped by her impact, not only on the thousands of children's lives, but also because Sharon was one who mentored me and she mentored others. Someone reached out this week to share that she teaches Sunday school now because she was mentored and taught by Sharon. That's her impact. She laid the foundation, she influenced it, and she's left a mark. The second is Pat. Pat dedicated her time in many, many ways. She taught Sunday school, she led Bible studies, and she used her amazing alto voice every week here, singing in the choir, helping all of us experience God in worship. But another way that Pat used her time is that she was the consummate encourager. She took time to know you. She took time to speak to you. She took time to care for you. And she took time to teach you. She made time for everyone. And so as we continue Pat's legacy, I'm gonna invite you to do something for me right now. I want you to think about today, picking up the phone and calling someone just to encourage them. Call a neighbor, call a friend, just check in, express gratitude. Maybe offer that long overdue apology and ask for forgiveness. Send a text to one of your grandchildren, a child, a coworker, a friend, and let them know how proud you are of them. All right, go ahead. You can pull out your phones right now and do that if you want to. You know, opportunities to leave a legacy are all around us, even in these small acts of kindness and compassion. What's a third resource we have? You know we have to talk about it and it's our things. It's pretty clear that when we pass away, we can't take our things with us. And in scripture, it makes it even clearer. We find in 1 Timothy, we didn't bring anything into this world and we can't take anything out of it. And so the good news is that leaving a legacy means that we get to be generous with our things. And so your resource of generosity is one where you can begin to think about how will I use my things and my finances? How can I be more generous to live into my legacy story? First, one of the greatest legacies that you can leave to those you care about is to get your finances in order. That includes a plan to establish a budget, eliminate debt, to begin getting uh, a, and build up a savings, to be generous, and to get a will or trust in place. This is something that all of us should be doing, whether we're 18, 
386888. Thanks to the generosity of a donor here at Resurrection who is living into their legacy through an estate gift has made possible resources that can help you with this plan. And so just reach out to the donor relations team and we'd be glad to help you. If you're of retirement age, then your plan also might include downsizing early and the beginning to pass along some of those heirlooms now. You might have a painting or a piece of jewelry that you don't even wear anymore, furniture. Passing it along now gives you the opportunity to get to continue to experience the joy of it as you see your heirs enjoying it. I've talked to several who have had the opportunity and made the decision to go ahead and do this. And in every case, they have described the peace that they feel. Your legacy also includes financial generosity through organizations and the causes that you support, particularly this church. Your giving here at Resurrection through our annual fund and capital campaigns demonstrates sacrifice as well as commitment to the work of God for impact with children, with students, with adults, with those with special needs, grief ministry, recovery ministry, missions. The list is so long. And through your generosity, we get to hear daily the stories of lives that have been changed, of the difference that you've made in communities. And so I want to tell you how grateful we are witnessing what God is doing through each and every one of your gifts is extremely moving. And because we can't take our money with us, the legacy of generosity extends in our passing. Of course, in your estate plan, you're gonna make provisions to care for those that you love. But you also have the opportunity, and today I invite you to consider remembering the church in your plans as well. Remembering the church in your estate is about leaving a legacy where you are a part of God's work into the future for generations to come. And here's the beauty. The beauty of it is it doesn't cost any out of pocket now. By remembering the church in your will, you provide a gift that goes back to God and is one final act or expression of gratitude for what God has done in your life. The Resurrection Foundation is the ministry that stewards and invests these beautiful gifts for greatest impact. And when you remember the church in your will or a trust or by naming the church as a beneficiary and an IRA or an insurance policy, you get to be a part of God's continuing work to change lives, strengthen churches, and transform the world. 30 years, 50 years, 100 years, and let me just say, I believe, a thousand plus years from now. Seriously, how cool is that? Now, some of you may be thinking that estate planning is only for those that are extremely wealthy, and that's just simply not true. What we have dreamt about here at Resurrection is that all of you who call Resurrection your church home would consider a tithe or 10% of your estate to God's work. And so no matter the size of the gift, the math works in that. The idea is biblical. When Reed and I completed our paperwork to remember the church and our estate planning, there was just this deep sense of what an incredible privilege it is to know that in some small way, the gift of what this church has done for us, we are gonna get to continue to pass that along, having impact not only on our own children, but on our children's children's children. Friends, a planned gift is an opportunity for all of us to demonstrate and bear witness of the difference of what really has mattered to us most in our lives. The tithe honors God at your death and it sows seeds into the future ministry after you're gone. It's all about Christ and God's work through his church for generations to come. And here's the thing, 
You're never too young to go ahead and create this estate plan or too old. Recently, we received documentation that a young couple here at Resurrection, just getting started in their careers, have already named the Resurrection Foundation in their estate plans to bear witness and to say, this church is important to us. This is a priority and we want it to be a memorial or to remember that in the ways that we live our lives. The Resurrection Foundation has a number of really beautiful funds. And so if you've already done the work of naming uh, the Resurrection Foundation in your estate plan, just let us know. We'd love to be able to get, have you complete a donor declaration and then help you let us know how it is that you have most dreamt those gifts will be stewarded in the future. To see the funds and to get more information, again, you can go to next. Can I give you another example of someone who's living their legacy? I wanna introduce you to Suzanne. Every time I meet with Suzanne, I leave our conversations a better person. Here's a picture of Suzanne with our summer interns from last year. The church has a summer internship program where college aid students come to serve at the church for the summer. They get experience, they um, are equipped vocationally. And not only that, but all who have participated have described to us what an incredible and profound impact spiritually their internship has had on them. Suzanne told me last year, after seeing the light in the eyes of the summer interns, as they shared that experience and the impact it had had on their lives, that she knew she needed to find a way for this program to continue into perpetuity. So through her estate planning, Suzanne has been able to create a fund within the Resurrection Foundation that will ensure Resurrection has an internship program for generations to come. You may have a similar passion. Maybe God's placed something on your heart as a way to steward your resources and we can help. Remembering the church in your estate plans is a significant way of being able to be a part of God's work in the future. And so will you join me and take the next steps to consider what it would take to remember the church and your planned gift. At the heart of legacy is faithfulness. It's the idea that we will be faithful with everything God has given us and that we will use those resources to do good things for others. And so how do we start? First, I wanna encourage you to write that legacy letter just writing it to yourself. Secondly, tell your stories, share them with others. Third, begin to think about how to share your time and create experiences. Fourth, be generous. Think about how you want to use your resources in ways that make a difference for others. And then fifth, consider remembering the church in your estate plans. What's the legacy you wanna be known by? You know, each of us has been influenced by others who have left an imprint on us. And my hope for today is that you've been encouraged to be intentional about the imprint or the mark that you're going to leave. Fingerprints are imprints. They are marks that show evidence that someone has been there, even if you can't see them. Recently, my son, daughter-in-law, and our 20-month-old grandson were down at the lake. The next weekend, I came down and I was greeted with these amazing, precious imprints of my grandson's fingerprints all over our sliding glass door. Seeing it blessed me so much because it was a reminder that he had been there. And so as we close, I wanna invite you to look at your hand. 
Will you take your hand and will you turn it over? And will you look at your fingerprints? Did you know that you have a fingerprint that no one else has? We share 99% DNA with all humankind, but there's 1% difference that's evidenced by our unique fingerprints. God has raised you up to leave an imprint. You will leave an imprint that no one else in the past has ever done, no one today will do, or no one in the future will ever do, evidenced by the fact that you have a fingerprint that nobody else will ever have. So what will you do with your 1%? Because it's Memorial Weekend and because we started in cemeteries in Pennsylvania and Mississippi, I'm gonna end the sermon at a cemetery in Salem, Salem Cemetery in Bushton, Kansas. Here in the cemetery, each headstone bears the name of someone who left a legacy, whether they knew it or not. Their stones tell stories. This is the headstone of Abilene Schoenig. Now, Abilene loved the Methodist church. She met Jesus in the Methodist church and she invested back in it. This is how Abilene's obituary tells the story. Miss Abilene Schoenig was born in Germany in 1856. At the age of 14, she with a brother came to Davenport, Iowa. In a short time, her brother suddenly took ill, leaving Abilene a stranger in a strange land. She found community and family in the Methodist church and gave her life to Jesus there. There she met Ferdinand Schoenig and they were united in holy matrimony moving to Kansas and settling on a farm southwest of Bushton. Three children, four grandchildren came to this marriage. Abilene was always ready and willing to help the needy, a friend to all she met. She was cheerful through all the hardships and pleasures of early pioneer days and did her part in helping build up a Christian community. She mothered many of the school teachers, giving them a home and a mother's care while they were in the community. She taught Sunday school to children. To many, she was Mother Schoenig. She loved God, she loved the Methodist church and gave it her best effort in an active Christian life. The record of her life will stand as a living monument. Her living monument, her stone, has led us to today. You see, Abilene Schoenig's love and commitment by giving her all to build a Christian community rooted in the Methodist church has left an imprint, a legacy laying the foundation where four generations later, her great, 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 great granddaughter would be standing here before you today in one of the largest churches sharing a message of legacy. This was something that she couldn't probably have even begun to dream about. After 30 years of ministry, I've often wondered how in the world did I get here? In finding Abilene's obituary her story by going through that box with my mom, I know now I am a product of her legacy. And so like Mother Schoenig, there are gonna be people that you'll never meet that are going to be blessed by how you live. What imprint are you leaving for your family for your friends, for this church, and for future generations. Memorial Weekend reminds us to pause and to remember, to remember those that have gone before us, each leaving an imprint and a legacy, 
And it gives us the challenge to think about this question. What is our legacy story now? What is the legacy I will leave? And how will I be intentional about leaving it? And when your children ask in times to come, what do these stones mean? My prayer is that your stones reflect the goodness of God in your life. Let's pray. Oh my gosh, Lord, thank you for your faithfulness that's been demonstrated over and over again for us. May we have greater awareness of how the legacy that we leave bears witness to our love and our gratitude for you. You created us uniquely to leave an imprint that no one else can do. And so may our stories, our time, and our finances be used by you today and into the future for generations to come, changing lives, strengthening churches, and changing this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching this week's sermon. We'd love for you to join us again in worship online or in person. To learn more about Church of the Resurrection, you can visit core.org. Have a great week, and we hope to see you next time.